Welcome to APCUG's Wednesday Workshop, where we take a little bit of time in the middle of the week, in the middle of the day, and talk tech and learn things about technology. We're here today with a double feature, Google actually. We've got uh, Bill James will be doing uh, the beginning, talking about the Chromebook, and then second half of our presentation, Chris and Jim, the geeks on tour that we all know so well, will be doing a session on a new program called Snapseed, Seed Snap, whichever it is. Snapseed. <laughs> snap snap seed. Snap seed. That. Good, snap good for you. Seed. <laughs> Very good. All right. So they'll be on a little bit later for that. Uh, this meeting is recorded, and those who are registered. And we can match your names with your registration names. We'll get follow-up and links to this video afterwards. I hope you enjoy things today. I think we will. We're going to have a very large group today. So I hope you leave here with some extra knowledge about these two programs. So right now, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Bill James. We all know Bill. He's my good co-host. And uh, I also met, need to mention that Judy Tallur is here. If you have problems with your computer this week, send them to me in the chat box because Bill's too busy. So if you have Zoom problems, whatever, you send them to me. If you have questions for our presenters, then send those to Judy in the chat box. Don't send them to Chris and Jim. Don't send them to Bill. Don't send them to me. Send them to Judy. And she collects them and types them up, and then she asks them. We will ask uh, some questions of Bill after he's done, but we want to make sure that Jim and Chris have time for their presentation, and then we'll open it up for all sorts of questions after that. So, Bill, thank you for taking time and sharing with us. It's all yours. Welcome to our um, Wednesday workshop, and I'm Bill James, as John told you, and I'll be giving the presentation this morning on Chromebooks as an alternative. And uh, I kind of coined it as more computing without the trouble, but uh, starting out, maybe that may not be the case, but uh, anyway, we're going to have fun with this. So um, again, this presentation is brought to you by the APCU Speakers Bureau as a benefit of your group's membership. And um, let's talk Chromebooks. Let's just say you're in a need for a new a book, um, uh, computer for gaming, keeping up with social media and doing others, uh, and maybe some serious work. Well, up until about five years ago, most people thought that uh, Windows machines or Macs were the best laptops. However, in my opinion, that's rapidly changing because Chromebooks have caught up with so much that they are really a viable uh, competitor for many buyers. And you might think the Chrome OS and uh, operating system and the Chromebook itself might be the future for um, mainstream consumers. And I say that because uh, some people are looking for an alternative to Microsoft Windows. Um, so what you need to do if that's the case, take stock of what you do every day with your computer. You may find that there's really nothing that you can't accomplish with a Chromebook. One of the things that makes them really a viable competitor, in my opinion, is they're fast, they're secure, they're easy to use, and you get updates in just a, a very few minutes. Uh, the average full Chromebook uh, OS update is over 400 megabytes, and the minor uh, updates are about 50 megabytes. So that's not a whole lot of data that you have to uh, send down to your computer. And um, Chrome are, releases a new uh, OS update about every six weeks, and uh, minor ones, um, such as security fix, happens every um, two to three weeks. So this presentation is going to cover why you might want to check out a Chromebook. Uh, one of the things you have to remember is that, uh, like uh, most Google uh, services, the, uh, your Google account, like your Microsoft account or Apple ID, consists of an email address and password. And it's 
essential for you to be able to get the best um, um, experience with your Chromebook. Uh, for Google, remember it's the Gmail address and password. For example, xxx at gmail.com and then whatever password you created. One of the things I think we need to really uh, put in our minds that when we talk about PC, that's just, uh, again, in my opinion, just a generic form for personal computer. And it really applies to any device that's running a computer operating system. Each platform, of course, has its advantages and disadvantages because of size, weight, security, apps, performance, and battery life. For me, those are very important because I want something that's lightweight, I want something that's secure. I want to have the apps that I can use across uh, multiple devices, and I want to have long battery life. So when you're shopping for uh, a uh, laptop, it, kind of make those comparisons because as you look, you'll see that the Windows laptops, both Mac and Chromebooks are getting closer and closer to each other's strengths while reducing their weaknesses. Chromebooks, in my opinion, again, are a clear winner in all those categories. So what makes a Chromebook a PC? Well, first, uh, think of a Chromebook as your one size fits all computer for internet dependent usage. In the, uh, <clears throat> internet dependent usage. Uh, Chromebooks are often referred as cloud books because they store their files on Google's virtual servers. This means that there's very little is stored locally on your Chromebook. So as a result, you'll find that the internal storage of Chromebooks are rather small. You also have to uh, get out of your mind of having uh, a C drive or, or D drive or any of those things because that's not how uh, data is uh, stored on your Chromebook. They're really optimized for PC users who depend on Google for everything. That means from email to editing documents to uh, spreadsheet creation. And they're engineered to utilize the online web applications and cloud storage rather than programs and hard drive storage. They're a lightweight answer for anybody that wants to have a cloud-based PC. Because unlike typical uh, PCs, Chromebooks are different. Instead of running Windows 10 or the Mac OS, Google has created its own operating system called Chrome OS, and it's based on the Linux kernel. Some of the major manufacturers of Chromebooks these days are HP, Acer, Dell, and Lenovo, and they offer their own versions and Chromebooks in different screen sizes and processors. And what I mean, you can get a Chromebook from anywhere from 11 inches to, I even found one that's actually a 17 inch, as well as processors. Some are using the very low powered, what we refer to as the ARM processors, all the way up to i5s. Uh, so if you are brand loyal to a certain manufacturer, then you should be able to find a Chromebook that's being offered. So um, again, laptops are a minimalist stream for the PC user world. As I say, more computing without the trouble. So what makes them uh, really uh, lightweight is the fact that, um, and I'm talking about in terms of software is that they are, uh, they're using the Chrome browser basically as they're, they're not basically, they are using the Chrome browser. And uh, while you have uh, operating uh, specific features like the file manager, app launcher, taskbar, and so on, most of your work uh, resides within a Chrome tab. I think we're all familiar with tab browsing. And if you use that, then you'll be right at home with a Chromebook because that's exactly what occurs. So um, what that all translates is to low overhead, uh, enable a faster startup, snappy performance, even on the most low end hardware. So our core functions uh, for Chromebooks 
And like many Android installs, is the Chrome uh, operating system focuses on Google services, like Gmail, YouTube, Maps, Docs, and Google Drive. These are the services or apps where you'll find that will be already installed on your Chromebook when you receive it. And then you can install other web-based uh, applications such as the Microsoft Office. And now you can talk, uh, also install Android apps from Google Play Store. We'll talk more about that later. The big question for you though, is that uh, do you have to be connected uh, to uh, the internet to use a Chromebook? Well, the answer is you do not really, because for certain, um, uh, certainly you'll have to do it. If you have cloud-based apps or using remote desktop tricks, you'll need an internet connection. But like for many applications, which would include Google Drive, the Kindle app, Gmail, Google Calendar. Those applications also allow you to store working versions on your Chromebook for offline use. So just like any other Android apps available through the Google Play Store, they work fine without an internet connection. And some of the others that might be included in that list is Instagram, Dropbox, Evernote. And if you want to watch a movie or view your photos or listen to your favorite music on a Chromebook, you could just download them to your uh, device. Now, because Chromebooks essentially have small um, internal storage, uh, you're not going to be able to load uh, a bunch of stuff to it. So you have to be really selective in what you decide that you want to have um, physically stored on the device. You also can use offline ready apps to keep your um, using on your Chromebook when it's not connected to the internet. So again, some of the examples would be read and write emails with offline Gmail. You can write a note uh, using Google Keep, create documents, slides, spreadsheets, um, using Google Docs, uh, sheets and slides. Both of those have an online, offline uh, capability. You can view your Google Calendar. You can edit photo saves with the built-in photo editor. Uh, you can enjoy music and movies with the built-in media player. Um, the Google Play video content is also available offline using the um, Chrome browser extension. One of the first things you'll notice about a Chromebook is the keyboard. Instead of having the traditional function keys you'll find that there's a row of keys for specific Chromebook uh, functions. If you look at my example at the, on the bottom of the screen here, you'll see that uh, where we have the typical of uh, F1 through F10, you find um, some symbols, which look more like ones that you would find uh, on a phone or a other mobile device. And here's a better, uh, picture of that. As you can see, um, you have the uh, escape key, your forward and back buttons. Um, your refresh, uh, there's a couple of the buttons that are different uh, than uh, typically uh, on your uh, PC keyboard. You also notice that uh, uh, you see that there is a, a search key. We'll talk about that button um, uh, in a few minutes. But the unique re uh, keys on your Chromebook keyboard is that um, the little spyglass is used for, as a search key, and now it's been named what is referred to as the anything button. Uh, to turn off your caps locks on, you press the all and the uh, anything button or press the off and the luncher button. Um, as I said, you can, uh, you have the back and forth buttons to take you um, to a previous page or the next page. Uh, the little uh, backward circle is your refresh, a current page. Uh, you can um, use the little brackets button 
to make the uh, page full screen. Um, the uh, one that looks like a uh, window with uh, other windows behind it allows you to show all your open windows. You can, uh, something that looks like a camera allows you to take a screenshot and then the little um, sun-like button allows you to decrease uh, the screen brightness. Uh, there's one that's uh, larger that also allows you to increase. So that's something you just have to uh, get accustomed to, but it's not really a huge learning curve. But by the same uh, token, that those buttons, as I showed you in the previous slide, are numbered, they can function as uh, traditional function keys. About the anything button, you may know this key by another name. It's the new name for what's referred to as the lunch or search, and that's the button that has the little spyglass on it. Uh, they chose that to reflect uh, uh, user feedback and also highlight uh, that Chromebooks have a dedicated button on their keyboards and they were used to search through files, apps, Google Drive, the web, and so forth. Much kind of like the Windows button that's on uh, your PC. It allows you to do uh, specific things or the command button on a Mac. So Google uh, has now uh, relabeled what used to be um, called the um, lunch or search button as the anything button. So um, you may still see references to the launcher within your Chromebook, but the anything button is, uh, will make it simpler to explain. So um, another feature about Chromebooks is that a uh, few applications are actually installed on the hard drive. Uh, the applications shown in your apps launcher are links really that open web applications uh, in the Chrome web browser. So when you want to view the applications on your computer, you can do it in a couple ways, uh, pressing the everything button. Uh, and I said anything earlier, it was everything, my, my apologies opens the app launcher and places a cursor in the search bar. The um, scroll uh, between Windows and the app launchers, you can do it by using uh, the, your two favors on your uh, touchpad. Um, touchpad is very important on a Chromebook because uh, there are specific gestures that allow you to do specific things. Uh, which I don't really think are duplicated by using the mouse. So when you click the uh, the uh, everything uh, button or the launcher key, uh, that icon is located on the bottom left of your desktop on the Chromebook itself. And uh, your there's many shortcuts for uh, several applications that are in place but they uh, will differ from uh, Chromebook to Chromebook. You also can easily add additional apps through um, the Chrome Web Store. So again, um, Chromebooks are designed for use while they're connected to the internet and when you're signed into your Google account. So instead of installing traditional programs such as a word processor or email clients, you use web apps from your uh, Chrome Web Store or the Google Play Store. Uh, although, as I said earlier, the, some of those require an internet connection, certainly to get them downloaded. Uh, you again are allowed to um, use many of these offline. Another thing that's a key feature about uh, Chromebooks is that they have what's called the multi-layer security architecture, which emulates the need for a, any antivirus software. And I'll talk more of that um, on this later also. So when we're actually looking at the anatomy of a Chromebook, these are some of the things that come to you right out of the box. First, 
the Google Chrome, which is your browser, which it allows you to view uh, your web pages, perform uh, most of your tasks on your Chromebook. There's another one that's called Files, and this app allows you to manage your files. Just it's it's Google's version of the File Manager uh, on both your Chromebook, Google Drive, and any other external media you might have plugged in. One of the amazing things about Chromebooks is that you can just plug in virtually any uh, uh, device, and they will work on a Chromebook. Google Docs are uh, part of the um, Google Suite, as well as drawings, sheets, slides. Uh, these are the equivalent. Google Docs is uh, equivalent of Microsoft Word or um, uh, the free versions of uh, like LibreOffice. Uh, I can't remember the titles of all of those. Uh, different pieces, but uh, Google Docs is the equivalent as well as drawings um, is like uh, your um, um, I can't remember now what it is for uh, a paint, I'm sorry, drawings is like paint in, uh, in, in uh, Microsoft Office. And Google Sheets, of course, is a spreadsheet, slides is PowerPoint. And then, of course, Google Drive is um, their cloud storage. Um, there's also other uh, applications that are not included, but you can download, such as Google Forms, uh, Google's My Maps. The web store is the uh, repository for the apps and themes that are uh, specifically created for the Chromebook. And then newer Chromebooks also will include the Google Play Store a lot that allows you to run Android apps. So you have access uh, for uh, the, the Google Play Store it really has allowed you to, to expand and have uh, lots more uh, apps and games uh, that are both free and paid for. So using that, the Google Play Store really expanded the uh, platform. And that was one of the most exciting changes that Google made to the Chrome OS was to allow the additional um, Android app support. So you could already run uh, many of the Chrome browser extensions, as well as the web apps and Chrome apps. But uh, earlier you could not use the Android apps, but with this uh, addition, it really increased the platform's value. So any um, Chromebook that uh, today, uh, you'll find the Play Store uh, as one of the applications that's uh, that's uh, included in the OS. So um, a little discussion about the Android uh, OS and Chromebooks. Uh, Android is a mobile operating uh, uh, system based on a modified version of Linux and other off open offering software designed primarily for touchscreen mobile devices such as your smartphones and tablets. And it was developed by a consortium of developers known as the Open Headset Alliance, and it was commercially sponsored by Google. They unveiled that product in November of 2007 uh, with the first commercial Android device, which was called the HTC Dream, uh, being launched in September of 2008. So if you have a Chromebook that was introduced after 2017, it's guaranteed to run most Android apps. And so the overall functionality of your Chromebook was extensively enhanced by this merger. And one of the most talked about perks uh, that is not offered by any other operating system. I think Microsoft is trying to uh, include some of those Android apps, at least in Windows 11, there's been some discussion that they will be available 
or you have to go through, uh, I believe it's the Amazon store to get those. But that feature really has totally been introduced, but it's supposedly coming. But the Chromebook can do it today. Uh, so that means that any Adobe uh, or Microsoft apps that were created for the Android are now available to be installed in your Chromebook. Uh, there's a list that Google provides that show you uh, which apps are compatible. And uh, they're rolling out the uh, Android uh, compatibility um, on a device by device basis. So you have to check with your specific model. But if you, when you buy it and you find the Google Play Store um, included, then you will uh, know that you'll be able to use the uh, Android apps. And there'll be some differences. Uh, some of the screen sizes uh, uh, for the Android, <clears throat> which is true, even if you use a tablet, uh, they're not always designed for the larger screen. So uh, you might have to contend with that issue. <laughs> Um, one of the things that you might discover, at least you hear, is that uh, the Chromebook specifications um, really appear to be weak compared to a Windows laptop or their counterparts. And the reason why, because uh, they don't need to be super powerful. Um, they were never intended to run desktop software or Android apps for that matter. But one of the things about your Chromebook, it always uh, will, uh, it starts new and stays new over time. And you have the automatic updates in the background. Your device always gets the latest uh, software without any interruptions to you. What I call stretching the limits, um, Chromebooks uh, do have their strengths as well as their weaknesses. So uh, one of the, uh, what might be considered one of the biggest flaw is the uh, inability to install traditional desktop software. But uh, I contend again, as I said earlier, to compensate, there are plenty of Android and Chrome uh, applications that you can find that will, uh, you can substitute for any window or Mac desktop apps. And we'll be seeing a demonstration of that later today. <clears throat> so if you're a pro prolific Google product user, all these services and apps, they work well together with the Chrome OS. Uh, but sometimes um, the problem lies uh, with some of us who want and need more than the Google services that are available. So for, uh, to compensate for that, uh, we could use what's referred to as Chrome extensions. And if you're familiar with the Chrome browser, you know they have extensions that allow you to uh, expand uh, the functionality of, of the Chrome browser. So if you're looking for something to, uh, to improve the way uh, you're using your Chromebook, you can uh, utilize those uh, extensions uh, to emulate a, what I call a desktop experience. Uh, because the Chrome browser is an integral part of the Chrome OS. Uh, so most of the uh, extensions that were designed for the browser will also work in Chrome. And some of these, for example, uh, that I will highlight here are the, is the Google Remote Desktop, uh, the Microsoft Office Extensions, and the Real-Time uh, Tab Sync. And what those are, first of all, the Chrome Remote Desktop, it allows you to remotely connect and control a device from your Chromebook, such as a Windows or Mac computer. And this was another product that was developed by Google and uh, it can be used on uh, a Mac or Windows PC as well as Android and other um, iOS portable devices. And to use that, you sign in with your Google account on, your, uh, on the Chrome Remote Desktop's official website. And once you get signed in, you now have complete access 
to the remote computer from your Chromebook. It's sort of like using your Chromebook as a terminal. Uh, you'll be able to execute and use programs that are not available on your Chromebook. You can view and manage and save files. Uh, you can read, write, and send emails from that remote computer. If you um, download the Microsoft Office extension, you are able to uh, put the um, Microsoft um, um, icon uh, on your um, Edge toolbar, which you can download Edge to your Chromebook if you want to use that as well. And you'll be then directed to your Office files whether they're stored online or on your computer. And you get uh, the features of Word, Excel, PowerPoint, OneNote uh, in your browser when having Office installed. So uh, when you're using that um, Office extension, you have to sign in with your Microsoft account and once you're signed in, it allows you access to your to the full office suite, as you can see on the uh, right side of my screen here. And from the Chromebook, uh, you'll be uh, using the mobile version of Office, and uh, but it still allows you to view and manage and save documents, create them, do whatever you want. Um, they will be saved to OneDrive, which will make them available on all computers. And I do this quite frequently. I, I've, I don't like to be tied down uh, to a desk anymore. I, I usually like to, uh, as some people say, uh, do stuff with my fuzzy uh, slippers with my bathrobe. And so I might be uh, sitting on the couch or whatever, or sometime I wake up in the middle of the night and I'll grab whatever device that's handy. And uh, I could log into uh, OneDrive, pull that document down, make some notes, um, create a draft and uh, not completely finish it, but the next day I can go back and pull that up on a more traditional um, device, such as my uh, uh, PC or whatever, and finish it out. And sometimes I actually just, uh, fill up, uh, finish it out using my Chromebook. So I, I really don't feel that I have to be tied down to a desk. I was tied down to a desk for 42 years when I was working. And so uh, that experience is not one I want to repeat. So uh, the other one that you can do is real tab sync. And what that means is that if you're browsing on your uh, PC using Chrome, those uh, tabs that you break up will be available on your um, other devices as well. So, and uh, such as your bookmarks or any of those things that you do in Chrome, you can always have those always sync to your other devices so that you don't have to recreate your bookmarks or your favorites or any of those. Or even you can always go back to where you left off as you happen to uh, was working on, on your Chromebook and you brought up a website that you liked and uh, you put it down and later on you uh, were working on another device such as your phone or whatever, um, you can always go back to those, uh, those uh, places that you had visited will be available to you. So to use that, uh, you'll find that uh, you can toggle this on and off from the extension icon. And this again will be on your uh, Chrome browser. And so uh, it works in unison with the Chrome on startup settings. So if you choose open a new tab, it will start with a new tab and sync the tabs from other computers on your network or previous uh, sessions in the background. And then if, as I said earlier, if you choose to use continue where I left off or a set of pages, it will merge them with the sync tabs and so windows and tab portions, uh, positions and sizes can be individual in each device uh, as the uh, synchronization only takes place in the account, uh, the tabs uh, URL. Uh, so it implies that you're to to um, keep your tabs across sessions. 
and you can remove them at the end or whatever you choose to do. One of the other things that people frequently ask is about photo editing. Is it really for Chromebooks? But one of the questions asked is, can I use uh, Photoshop? And the answer really is no, at least not the full version that you find on other platforms. But that doesn't mean that you can't do any photo editing. What it really means, uh, what's the key is rather, is that knowing when you need Photoshop versus when you just need something to edit photos. Uh, because there are some really powerful tools available for Chromebooks, perhaps not as quite as powerful as Photoshop, but they can get pretty close uh, for most of us. Um, so um, the um, Chromebook is an excellent, often cheaper alternative to, to uh, most laptops uh, uh, that's running Windows and um, Microsoft. I'm sorry, Mac, the Mac OS. <clears throat> uh, so come, the common consists is that you can't perform resource intensive tasks like editing photos and videos on a Chromebook. But there are some photo and editing editors for Chromebooks for really professional uh, photographers. And some Chromebooks have very high specs uh, like the Google uh, Pixelbook Go or the Samsung Galaxy Chrome 2. So they can make the Chrome OS machines much more flexible editing machines. Uh, one of the uh, photo editors that you might want to look at uh, is that uh, is Plexor. Now, one of the things that we have to remember that you don't really need a insane amount of horsepower uh, to run uh, a lot of these editors. Um, because they're uh, run in a web browser and let the uh, server side handle all the heavy lifting. The Pexor editor has two versions. There's the Pexor X, which is kind of the easy beginner's one. And then there's the Pro version. Uh, these both are free and they will allow you to do many things that you'd be surprised. Um, you can, uh, one, of the, one of the things it has is a background remover that uh, um, can take out um, extraneous things in your pictures, or you can uh, create a transparent uh, image um, uh, with just a few uh, keystrokes. Um, Polar is another editing tool uh, if you're bored to retouching photos and you want cool filters and the like, uh, this um, uh, 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 Plexor would probably uh, not leave you wanting for more because it, uh, it comes in with uh, all these great tweaks that you could use. It's very intuitive, easy to use, and you can use uh, it also for free. Uh, another one is Snapseed, which is one that will be um, demonstrated later. And it's another free app for your Chromebook. And it's available for uh, Android and iOS as well. And it was developed by a company called uh, Nick Media. And it has everything that you're looking for in a photo editing application. Uh, it has a simple and user-friendly interface. Uh, easy to use controls that make it suitable for everyone who likes to play around with their images. And I'm sure Chris is going to demonstrate that. There's uh, both an amateur and pro version. Uh, so um, it has many tools, including filters, um, lots of other things uh, that uh, she will be demonstrating using her Chromebook. And there's tutorials that you can also uh, watch um, and then uh, edit your photos or pictures. Now, um, if you're just insisting on using Adobe, then um, you can use, again, as we stated earlier, you can use the Chrome Remote Access to interface with the Adobe apps that you have installed on a, another device. Uh, there are also Photoshop Android apps that run on Chromebooks. 
and you can get those from the Google Play Store. You can install the Adobe uh, Photo Express, um, the Photoshop Mix, the Photoshop Fix, the Photoshop Sketch. So you can use uh, the Photo uh, Shop Android apps to edit your, your photos. And then there's a couple other um, Android apps that you can get, the Adobe Lightroom, Illustrator, and much more. Um, other things that you can get um, to increase the functionality of your Chromebook is um, Skype and Zoom and the Google Assistant. So you might think of the Chromebook as a little computing engine that could. Uh, you can hold remote meetings with friends, family, co-workers with Skype and Zoom. Uh, you can run the run-of-mill standbys like Facebook, YouTube, Netflix, WhatsApp, and all the Google Suite apps like Drive, Calendar, Gmail, on or offline. Uh, you can play all types of music such as Spotify, SoundCloud, Apple Music, dozens of news, sports apps, uh, Kindle, the Tumblr, Steam, or whatever um, you desire, you can probably find an application either in the web store or the Google App Store that will um, uh, suit your fancy. Watching movies on a netbook, that's really a, a, an ideal too because the netbook, it's the, I mean, the Chromebook is such, um, such a lightweight uh, device, it's easily you can carry just about anywhere. So you can download your flicks for remote use. Um, you can store movies and shows that you like to download music files to your Chromebook. Uh, with um, the Google Play Movies and TV Chrome extension installed, you can uh, launch those quite easily. And uh, one of the things that's a good thing about uh, Chromebooks is the battery life is uh, really uh, quite impressive. So you really don't have to worry about uh, running out of uh, power before the movie is over with. Um, if you like to use uh, Chromebook for Zoom, uh, like I'm doing today, um, there is a um, web program, um, you know, specific uh, Chromebook uh, app that's called the Progressive Web Application. And um, it offers much of the same Zoom functionality as you would experience on your Windows or Mac desktop. Um, it even has uh, more features than the previous Zoom app for the Chromebook. Now this one is available in the Google Play Store so it's not one that uh, it's uh, it's not native a native application to the Chromebook uh, as you would find using the one that you would download from uh, the uh, the web store or from the Zoom website. But uh, it offers customizable gallery views on if the machine supports that. You can do uh, breakout rooms, live transcriptions, uh, live translations, a background masking feature, and uh, the raise hand and meeting reactions. Uh, and if you've uh, wanted to use a voice assistant or have any of the uh, Google devices, speaker devices, you can also, uh, the Chromebook has that capability uh, to run Google Assistant. Uh, and so then you can create shopping lists and rem reminders and uh, also have the uh, smart home controls as well. If you're into shortcuts, um, Chromebook has that as well. You can use the control plus alt uh, plus uh, the function key to simultaneous open windows listed on all keyboard shortcuts. Um, you can also have various windows like uh, 
you can use the overview mode. I want to see windows on uh, your desktop that you open on a screen. You just simply swipe three fingers down on your touch screen or trackpad uh, to uh, activate this mode. That's why I said that the trackpad is really um, uh, important to um, a um, Chromebook user because there are gestures that are specific to the device. Uh, you can have virtual desktops like Windows and uh, Mac OS. Chromebook has a native ability to create new virtual desktops. So you can assign different groups of Windows to different desktops just like you would in Windows. And here's a, uh, a view of virtual desktops. And it looks pretty much like the Windows screen, as you notice that the icons at the very top are the uh, active windows that are available. And then of course, down below, it shows the uh, windows that you, um, that you have uh, in use. So it's not really too different from uh, a uh, Windows computer in that regard. So uh, multitasking is not a problem. You can have something like, uh, I've got to say, equivalent to the uh, Windows Snap Assist. Uh, it will, uh, or your Chrome allows you to do that, the same thing. You can split your screens into two and you can have a browser open on the left and the Google Docs open on the right. Um, screenshots. It's simply it's very similar to using a window. You just control um, and the switch window key, which is that one that's in the middle uh, of your uh, control uh, keys at the top of your screen. I mean, copy your keyboard and you can do a screenshot. Now we talked about, uh, or I mentioned uh, the single layer and multi-layer solution. So I thought it would be appropriate to explain that more. And what <clears throat> that's meant is that a single layer architecture implies putting all the required components for a software application, both the back end and the front end on just one server. And what we're uh, implying here is, is security. So, if you're having all your resources on the same machine, you create an availability and security risk. So if the server is down, the application is down as well, and it does not communicate with the database. So again, if the server is, ex is service externally attacked, you have a greater risk of data loss if you do not have a replica of your database. So that's the single layer uh, uh, solution. But in the case of Google, they solved that problem by splitting your data across more than one server or multi-layer solutions. That's kind of the, the implied uh, with uh, using cloud storage because the data is spread across multiple servers. But having all the resources spread on different servers really boosts your, um, boosts your deployment performance. In addition, it also having different layers for different resources implies adding an extra security layer by separating data from code. So in these applications that include replication, the database can be replicated across more than one server, which prevents the loss of data in the case of a cluster failure. So uh, that's what I like about my Chromebook. One of the things is the security. It controls, um, it has some, that multi-tier solution. It keeps a tight grip on security and it also frequently updates its code database to stay a step ahead of the hackers. You have great battery life. Chromebooks are great for people on the go who spend a day away from a electrical outlet, typically um, you can get eight to nine hours. And the startup time is unbelievable. It's just a matter of opening the lid and uh, it's already uh, 
you already have a screen ready to go. And you have a fresh copy. Um, size and weight, the hardware requirements, the typical Chromebook weighs a few ounces lighter and can be a few tenths of an inch thinner than most uh, comparable PCs, uh, laptops. And recycling, if you decide you wanna give your um, uh, um, Chromebook away, you can use a app that's called Power Wash and it'll bring the uh, uh, computer back to factory fresh within uh, seconds. I remember I did that on my um, PC and it took more like uh, a day to get all that taken care of when I was trying to uh, get it back to factory. Uh, uh, in order to give it away. <clears throat> so um, if you like leading on the bleeding edge and like to experiment, you can, can you always can test the latest feature of the Chrome OS, uh, OS by switching to a more uh, experimental software channel. Um, Chrome OS has three software channels. They have the stable channel, which is the fully tested one. And it's updated every two to three weeks for minor changes and every six weeks for major changes. There's the beta channel to view upcoming changes and improve with somewhat a low risk uh, using the beta channel. Uh, it's updated roughly every week with major updates coming every six weeks, more than a month before the uh, stable channel gets them. And then uh, if you really want to get uh, on the bleeding edge, you can uh, use the uh, dev channel, their development channel, and you get updates once or twice a week. Uh, so it could have bugs uh, in it, but uh, it's really easy to to, um, to correct those. So um, like most computers, things do go wrong. Uh, but one of the things that's great about a Chromebook, it's a budget friendly uh, laptop, but it's not perfect. Um, as uh, with any computer, they have flaws and um, most common problems faced by Chrome builders can feel uh, difficult uh, because uh, some of the tools that you're accustomed to in Windows uh, to solve those problems are not necessarily available in, um, in a Chromebook. Um, so you can have issues you know, with updates uh, that from internet connectivity uh, but troubleshooting really uh, is not something that uh, that can really ruin your day. So here's a couple of examples that you might run into. Uh, maybe your Chromebook is running slow. So the best thing to do is just reboot it. That's a, that's something we do commonly with PCs. So that's no different for a Chromebook. Uh, if you find it keeps restarting. Uh, this could be a serious er uh, error that indicates a problem with the OS. So the solution for that is uh, use the power wash, which will give you a fresh copy uh, of the OS. And uh, it will uh, make attempts to save much of the data uh, as possible. But um, since the only ones that you would be at risk are the ones that you had physically stored on the, on the machine, if it's, uh, if you're showing everything to uh, drive, then all your files and documents will uh, will remain with no problem. You're just uh, up refreshing the operating system that's physically running uh, the Chromebook that has nothing to do with your data or files. So as it says here, it'll move any data that's actually stored on your Chromebook. So you might want to uh, do a backup uh, for that data uh, using a flash drive. Uh, if you have a problem with it updating and you get a, uh, by getting, uh, receiving an error, you can uh, usually resolve this by checking, make sure you have a good internet connection. Uh, are you, uh, 
have something that's probably, if you're using Ethernet uh, cable, you might want to check those and uh, find out that everything is, uh, is properly connected. <clears throat> you don't want to use uh, uh, data connection for updates as it uh, will use a lot of your monthly allotment if you don't have unlimited data. And that could cause an error message. Um, and then, of course, um, if you download an important update and it doesn't work, then uh, you might again try just rebooting the machine. If you can't sign in, uh, there are many different error messages you can get when signing into your Chromebook. So rather than going through each of them, uh, I would suggest you use uh, Google's uh, walkthrough for dealing with those errors. Uh, and then, of course, again, if things just go insanely wrong, you can just use the power wash, uh, and which in a matter of minutes, everything will be factory new. Uh, printing has been uh, somewhat problematic for some uh, Chromebooks, but you can print uh, from uh, most printers uh, that are connected to Wi-Fi or wired network. Um, Currently, most Bluetooth, uh, Chromebooks do not support Bluetooth printing, but you can connect your uh, printer to your Chromebook by using a USB cable. And when you use a cable, um, you get the notifications that says, uh, follow the um, on-screen instructions. Uh, and then again, if your Chromebook is using a USB cable, it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, connected. It doesn't need to be connected to the Wi-Fi. Um, Bluetooth, again, if uh, not all Chromebooks include Bluetooth, so you need to check your product specifications. If you're buying one and you want to use a Bluetooth device other than a printer, uh, you uh, might want to... Uh, see if uh, the Bluetooth is included. Uh, it'll have the regular Bluetooth icon that shows you, you know, that uh, it's uh, enabled. And if you uh, have Word documents and you uh, recently switched to a Chromebook and you're having trouble accessing your old documents, Here's a couple of workarounds. First, uh, you can uh, is use Google Docs. Another option, of course, is what I spoke about earlier, is using the Microsoft Office extensions in Chrome. Uh, and that uh, works just like um, the Office products that you have on your Windows desktop. So you. Uh, you'll be uh, uh, okay with that. <clears throat> now, one of the things that you have to, uh, to be aware of is that Chromebook does have an end of life. Uh, so um, what that means is that there will come a time when it will no longer receive updates from Google. Doesn't mean the machine is going to be completely worthless, but you just won't be getting some of the security updates or in some of the new features. And that's inevitable with most operating systems. Um, so what you need to do is that when you purchase one, you need to find out what the update schedule is. And in the settings under additional details, you'll see something that says update schedule, and it'll tell you the date the month and year that it will expire. In other words, in this case, there's one that's saying, uh, this device will get automatic software and security updates until June of 2024. Um, now there's a, what that means, according to Google, each Chromebook is guaranteed for a minimum of six and a half years of updates after the product's original release date. And that's not to be confused with the time you purchased it. So I understand now on the boxes themselves, uh, it tells you what that date is, what the manufacturer's date is. So um, when you go to the store and purchase it, you have no idea how long that 
particular unit has been uh, in the inventory. So it's a good thing to check. No, it's not a good thing. It is a thing it's essential that you check to find out when it was manufactured so that you will not be um, uh, getting a machine that's going to expire within the next uh, year or two or three months. And that would be um, very important if you were going to purchase a used one that you find out what that, that year end date is. So my final thoughts are what I love about a Chromebook is that it makes a great use of Google services and because there's next to no learning curve. And I say that with a bit of, uh, 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 what a caveat, there are, there's going to be a learning curve with any device that you receive, but I think uh, learning how Chromebook works uh, can be uh, very easily, easy uh, to accomplish. Uh, and even if you're doing something tricky that you haven't done before, uh, you can essentially work it out and uh, understand what the um, uh, quirks and uh, tricks are about getting it to work. So um, I think anyone can uh, pick up a Chromebook and know how to use it uh, because uh, th there's a lot of similarities between it and a Chrome browser. Uh, you can work comfortably uh, on a Chromebook without learning, um, leaning on a PC for support. Uh, some of the things that you were running on a PC, you can run on your Chromebook. Uh, or find a, a suitable substitute. Uh, but if you have really intensive needs uh, for graphic uh, design and uh, you play a really intense uh, game, you might want to uh, look at a higher end Chromebook um, to accomplish that. And when uh, you get into that realm, you'll find that uh, some of the prices of the Chromebooks are also equivalent to PCs. So um, you just have to make that decision of, of what you want and what the trade-offs are. Um, but if you're looking for a larger device and a phone or tablet to browse the web or access email, communicate with uh, Skype, do um, Zoom or any of the other basic computer functions, you'll find that you'll love a Chromebook. Uh, as I said earlier, they're available in various sizes and price points. You can find them as low as $100 uh, up to $1,000. And um, companies such as Dell, HP, Lenovo, and Asus, they all have models that will fit within your budget. Um, some of them are powered with uh, Intel i-series processors, while others are uh, using ARM processors. Um, they're basically just a very affordable lap uh, laptop with uh, uh, some limited resources, but they're distributed in such a way they do uh, uh, some things very well. So again, it's, uh, it's the ultimate minimalist computer. Um, so um, perfect computing solution uh, for... Um, Google um, dependent PC users, um, you, you don't have be, you won't be bogged down by any typical computer hardware uh, because uh, Google has paved its own lane in the laptop market. Uh, and it's by taking some of the features from the Mac and Windows users value, uh, it's been really um, become a, uh, um, the ultimate uh, alternate computer. Uh, here's some resources that you uh, might want to uh, uh, look into. One of the things is that uh, tomorrow, matter of fact, you can go register. Uh, there's a Tech for Seniors Chromebook learning uh, Chromebooks, and that's a monthly um, group, and they really get into the nitty gritty. You can go and ask questions about uh, 
of learning Chromebooks as well uh, as uh, using, uh, you have to register for it. Uh, I strongly suggest that you, uh, if you're really interested in using a Chromebook, this might be a, a really great resources, resource. The other resources here are those that are, um, are listed, uh, and these are uh, books and um, websites that you can go to uh, to get advice on how to, uh, to uh, use or acquire a Chromebook. So with that, um, that completes my presentation, and I, I um, hope that uh, you find that uh, a Chromebook is something that you might want to explore and, uh, and enjoy. It makes a really great second computer, in my opinion. And with that, I will turn uh, return control over to uh, John. John? Yep, that was great. Um, I even have to admit there are times when if I had the money, I would do uh, Chromebook. Since we're doing two presentations, this would be considered halftime. And for your halftime entertainment, here's Judy Tallur. <laughs> and all I'm going to say, John, is I'm holding uh, Bill's presentations into, until Q&A time after uh, Chris and Jim's presentation. So over to you, to over to them. Hey, I had to stop. Uh, Bill's presentation. Uh, I don't really think that Chris and Jim need much introduction. Uh, you can't be in one of our computer groups for APCUG without having had some contact with the Geeks on Tour. So I'm just going to turn it over to them because they've been with us many times. So Chris and Jim, it's your show now. It's good to see everyone and welcome and thank you for showing up. Thanks for inviting us to do this. One of my hey. favorite topics, photo editing in general and Snapseed in particular. Mm -hmm. This will just take a second to get set up. And, and I, I, we asked in the chat before, but it looks like we have maybe a few more Android users in this group. We are usually speaking to an audience of almost 50-50 of iPhone versus Android. So I have both. I will demonstrate both. And But good to know that it looks like maybe there's a few more Androids here. Yeah, should be fun. All right. So let's get our slideshow up. Editing photos with Snapseed. Take your photos from so-so to stunning with the free Snapseed app. Snapseed is by Google and it is free. You can and install Bill, it. Bill alluded to this in his he presentation did. earlier, and we think it is the best. Some people call it the Photoshop for your mobile devices. And we are Geeks on Tour, also known as Propeller Heads. And oh, here it is. <laughs> yeah. We do this so we don't take ourselves too seriously. And you know, another word for geek is propeller head. So, so that's a lot of fun for us. Our website is geeksontour.com because we are technology geeks. Both Jim and I have been in the technology training and support since the early 80s. Yeah, she started when she was like six or seven, <laughs> I guess. But she had the first computer training center in South Florida, so she knows her stuff. And together, we do a lot of traveling. We lived for 14 years in an RV and traveled the whole country. We also do international traveling. So we take a lot of pictures. If you're a traveler, you know what I mean. There's such gorgeous scenes. You take a lot of pictures. Okay, and we specialize in Google Photos, or Chris does. She's a platinum level product expert for Google Photos, and she wrote the book, Learn Google Photos. So check it out. Also check out our YouTube channel. So just go to YouTube and search for Geeks on Tour, and we do a live, like 45 minute to an hour show that we call what does this button do? We've done 226 episodes of them, 
They're all on our YouTube channel. And actually, tonight, we have a special one. Yeah, that's going to go out on Facebook, on our Geeks on Tour, and on our Learn Google Photos page. And it'll go out on YouTube at Geeks on Tour. And it's about photo editing. It does a little bit more on Google Photos. We're going to solely concentrate on Snapseed today. Okay. For you. I almost forgot to push that button. And if you have questions, you know, I, I love questions, but we do have a lot of material to cover. Please put them in the chat. And as I understand it, uh, Judy will relay them to us. I'll stop occasionally and ask if there are any questions. Yeah, I might have to find that. There it is. I found the chat. Now, our website is geeksontour.com. And the slide deck that we are going to show here, plus a class handout, plus a playlist of videos for this topic is all available if you go to geeksontour.com, find the classes page, and we have a page for today's class. You will see today's date and APCUG class on Snapseed. Click there and you will be able to get all of the class materials we leave it public for a couple of weeks, and then it becomes available for Geeks on Tour members only. So let's get to it. Photo editing with Snapseed. Snapseed is a free app by Google for iPhones and Android mobile devices. It is not available on computers, no Windows or Mac. It is a mobile, but it does work on Chromebook because Chromebooks can run Android apps. So we will show you that. First, I just want you to know that it's not just me that thinks Snapseed is great. Here is a quote from Android Authority. This is the photo editor we recommend first, followed by Adobe apps and then everything else. And the iPhone Photography School says if you're new to iPhone photography, this should be the first photo editor app that you download and use. So you do need to install it. It is a separate app. It's free from either the App Store on Apple or the Play Store on Google. And it is called Snapseed. I have no idea where that name came from. I don't you know, <laughs> I've, I've been meaning to re research that. What is snap seed i don't know maybe maybe the photo that you snapped is just the seed <laughs> of the photo that you can make when you know how to edit it correctly <laughs> yeah maybe. so one of the first thing after you install it you should check the settings and make sure that it is not resizing your images you don't want editing to lose you quality so Let's, let's do it. Snapseed is by Google. It means it works in conjunction with Google Photos, but for the most part today, I'm going to use it as a standalone app. So even if you don't use Google Photos, you will be learning how to do things from me today. So using Snapseed standalone, and I'm going to start off by using my iPad because it's, it's a nice big it's a nice big screen for working with. So here is my iPad. And notice this icon, this flowery multicolored icon, that is the photo app that comes with your iOS device, your iPhone or your iPad. I don't use that much. I use Google Photos. That's this pinwheel looking thing. But then there's Snapseed. That is the green leaf icon, and you get it from, from your app store. So I'm going to show you a couple things. Make sure I'm... You have that going to sleep too oh, soon. Oh, dear. So I'm going to open up Snapseed, and then it just tells you to tap anywhere to open a photo. But that photo must be on this device, so I made sure to put the photos I want on this device and it's in albums and i'm just going to show you a, a the simplest thing that you can do with snapseed and it's called looks so here is a photo 
I just, I love this photo. It's Jim walking on the beach, but ugh, it's so dark. I am opened the Snapseed app. I opened this photo. And the first thing I get all along the side here is called looks. And here is a look called morning. One tap. Is that a nicer photo or what? One tap. It's kind of like a filter. Other apps call them filters. Snapseed calls them looks. And I'll explain why in a minute. If you like the look, you tap the check mark. If you don't like it, you cancel it with the X. I like it. I tap the check mark. Now I want to save it, and that's this bottom button. But let me explain. Why, why do we just have these little icons? You might not know what the icons mean. Well, watch this. If I'm working with the f Snapseed in a vertical orientation, I see three words, looks, tools, and export. So those are the same things in the horizontal version this top one is looks, the pencil is tools, and the up arrow is export. So if I want to save it, I tap export, and then you have a couple options. I think that the true export is the best. It creates a new separate photo. All right. So let's do that one more time with a different photo. I tap Snapseed, and now it remembers the photo that was there before, but it, there's an open in the upper left-hand corner. Open, and I choose another photo. Open from device, albums and recent, and oops, open open, from device, albums, and recents, and I will pick, I will pick this photo of the Navy Pier in Chicago. And it's kind of dark. I can tap on the looks button, which is this top one, choose that morning and that looks a lot brighter and livelier. I can say yes I like that and then export and export. So that's the very very basics of how Snapseed works. You open Snapseed, you bring in a photo, you can use the easiest thing which is just the looks and then save it. But what else? Go back to slides. So that was using Snapseed in a standalone and notice if you are using your device in horizontal mode you see looks tools and export or no in vertical mode at the bottom you see looks tools and export or the other way around you see the little icons that still stands for looks, tools, and export. Okay, now let's do some more. When you're done, you, can, you need to save your edits. And as I said, there's a couple different ways to save. If you're going to use this a lot, you might get used to using the save or save a copy, which when you bring it back up, makes your editable makes your edits re-editable but i like to make absolutely sure that my edits are readable by any app so i use the export option when i save a a an edited photo and that's what we just did. We demoed using looks. We opened Snapseed. We tapped plus to open a photo. We chose a look, tapped checkmark to accept it, and then we saved with export. 
but there's so, so much more. Look at all these tools. Four times one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You know, there's 30 different tools that you can use with Snapseed. There's no way I can show you all of them. I've never even used all of them, but I do want to show at least, at least six, say. We're going to do, we're going to do tune image, details, perspective, brush, healing, HDR scape, and then if we have time, we will do a portrait and, and head pose. And then I want, to, I want you to understand what using the stack means, what the stack is. So understanding stacks. If you have used Photoshop, you might be familiar with a concept called layers. Stacks is the term that Snapseed uses for that and you can change anything in the stack. Now, even though we only applied one look so far, each look actually applies several different tools. So I wanna show you the stack for the pictures that we've already done. So back to my iPad, I'm gonna open Snapseed and with this photo, all I did was apply the morning look. But if I tap on this little button up here represents stacks or layers. If I tap that and then tap view edits, in the lower right hand corner now, you're seeing one, one two, three, four. So that morning effect applied white balance, details, curves, and tune image. And if I decided, oh, I don't want to change the white balance, I can tap on white balance and then the trash can. And it and then and then the back arrow to say, okay, I'm done. Huh. That white balance was apparently a very important part of that look because it looks bad again. All right, so that's just to, for you to understand what stacks means. It's the different edits that have been applied to a picture. Back to slides. So now I'm just gonna go through a bunch of pictures and do the things that I think make them look better. First one is HDR scape. If we have any what I call real photographers in the audience, you might know about HDR. If you use an S SLR camera to do HDR, HDR stands for high dynamic range. And what you do is you take three expo at least three exposures, an underexposed, a normal, and an overexposed. Then there are lots of software that put those three together to make an HDR, and they are extremely rich, almost three-dimensional. Whenever you see a professional photographer's photo that you just go, wow, odds are they used HDR. With Snapseed, you can take any regular photo and apply an HDR feature. So back here, and I saw one camera. This is an iPad. This is an iPad mini that I'm using here. Can you see, I mean, my hand with it to give you an idea of the size. So yes, it's nice to use the iPad because it's a little bit bigger than a phone. I go into Snapseed and I want to open a new photo. And let me find one. So I am going to open this, a photo that we took down in Miami 
we were visiting friends on a boat in Miami. And I thought this sunset was just such a beautiful view. Look at those palm trees. But it's, it's dark. And I don't want to just, you could lighten it, but watch this. I'm going to go to Tools and HDR Scape. So it's going to do the equivalent of those three exposures put together. HDR Scape. Boom. You now see the boats that you didn't even see before. And if I want even more, the way Snapseed works is you just rub to the right to get more. So I'm just going to rub my finger over to the right. You should see that the boats get even brighter. If I rub to the left, you'll really understand the difference. If I rub all the way to the left, it's back to just not seeing anything. So you can just rub your finger left or right to get the amount of the feature that, that you like. I like that. I tap the check mark. I export and export, and that is HDR. One more example of that. I'm going to open another photo. Open from device and albums, and hopefully I can find this photo of some of the old cars in Havana, Cuba. So this, we, we visited Cuba, and I just took this picture down a residential street of these cars. And, you know, it's nice, but watch this. I'm going to edit, or tools, HDR, and that's much better already, but I'm going to rub over to the right. I'm going to accept that with the check mark. And then I also want to crop it. Snapseed also has all the basic editing tools that every photo editor has. So here's the crop. And I'm just going to get closer to those cars and check mark. And yes, I like that. Now, I want to see what my original looked like. I can just long press. There's my original. When I let go, I see my edited. I hope you agree. The edited is a better picture. Okay. That was still HDR. Let's go to another one. So, okay, I'm going to open another photo. Open from device, albums, recents, and this one of the Gateway Arch. If you've ever been to St. Louis, Missouri, we snapped this picture as we were crossing the Mississippi River. Mississippi, right? Yeah. Or is it Missouri down there? Mississippi. Okay. <laughs> and that is the Gateway Arch. Cool shot, I think, but kind of dull. I could do an HDR on it, but there's another one up here under Tune Image. The very first option in the tools of Snapseed is called Tune Image. Now here, you have to know a little bit more about Snapseed. In order to see your options, you can rub your finger up and down. There are several options in the tune image. So I, and I especially like this one called ambiance. It's kind of a kinder, gentler HDR. Sometimes that HDR feature can be too much. Go to tune image, choose ambiance, now rub to the right, and see how you can see more detail in the trees. You get more blue in the sky, but without any harsh effects. Maybe this could be brightened a little too. I'll rub my finger up and down 
and I see that one of the image tuning options is brightness. Let's rub to the right to make it a little bit brighter. Okay, I like that. And I think that's enough for tune image. I'll check mark. I'm gonna use another tool, tap on tools, and the second tool. And I think there's a reason why this is the first and the second tool is because they are the first and the second tools you should learn and use in Snapseed. Details. Rub up and down to see your choices. You have structure and sharpening. Structure is kind of a 3D sharpening, if you will, and I really like it. I'm going to choose structure and then I'm going to rub to the right and see what it does. It just, it, it gives it a depth and a three-dimensional quality and a sharpness. I like it. I tap the check mark. Now I want to compare that. See, is, is this a better picture than what I started from? Long press, there's my original. It looks awfully dull now compared to the edited version. Original, edited version. Okay. Another tool that can come in handy is perspective. And for that, we have a pre-recorded segment one of our tutorial videos called uh, Perspective, and it's video number 599. It's just a couple of minutes. Okay. 599, and all of our tutorial videos are available on our website. There's 700 and some odd of them now. This is 599. Can you use Snapseed on video too? No, it's just for photos. Hi, this is Chris Gould with Geeks On Tour, and this show me video is about using Snapseed and the perspective. Perspective. So this is the skyline of New York City, and notice how the buildings are kind of crooked on the edge. So open in Snapseed. And uh, first, I'm, I'm going to do morning, so get, that's better. And then I'm going to go into tools and perspective. And all you do is rub your finger up or down, and it will change the angle of those buildings. And notice it even filled in. Did you see? That's how it was sideways. When I got the building straight, it left kind of a hole over here and it filled in that hole <laughs> with stuff that looked like buildings. All right. You can also do that with old photos. If, you ever, if you've ever just snapped pictures of old photos, I'll bet you you've get some where they're not square. Open in Snapseed. and tools, perspective, and just rub down until it gets square. You probably also want to crop this one. And then change the white balance. Now that was tools and white balance and neutral color. So if I just tell it what supposed, look how it automatically got rid of that yellow just by telling it what is a neutral color, is it live? Okay, so that's, that's a much better old picture. And save. I see one other question, and we will deal with this. When you export a photo in Snapseed, where is it saved? It's saved on your device in a folder, a device folder called Snapseed, a device folder on Android. iPhones don't have device folders, so it's just 
saved in your camera roll in an album called Snapseed. So it's, it's saved on your device. And then, as I do, I use Google Photos. I have Google Photos watching that place on my device and automatically uploading it to my Google Photos. So everything I do in Snapseed is also stored in my Google Photos account. All right, next. I'm ready for the brush tool. No, nope, not that yet. Yeah, how are we doing? Okay, uh, I'm gonna do the brush tool and then I will go to the Chromebook. So, actually, so for the brush tool, I think I will use my Android phone. Just so you can see, you folks will have the Android phone can do everything that I just did. This is, so I, there is Snapseed on the Android phone. You have to install it, get it from the Play Store. It's free. Snapseed and open and find a photo that you want to edit. Here's one of our sweet little camper van motor home that we do a lot of traveling in now. And let's say that I want to just, just make it look better. I am going to use a tool under tune image, rub up and down to see my choices. I really like this ambiance. Now I rub right and left. Can you see the difference there? There, that's no ambiance. It looks awfully dark and dull. Swipe to the right and it's just livened everything up. I check mark and I could export. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna bother. Now another photo that I want to use a brush tool on. Now for that, I'm going to have to go to my Google Photos. And I'll show you how Google Photos can open it in Snapseed. So I go to Google Photos because I'm looking for a photo that isn't on my device. It's from a few years ago. But my Google Photos has my entire lifetime of photos and it was in New Zealand. So I am going to search and go to my maps to find a photo from New Zealand. And I know pretty much where it was. It was near Akaroa, so I can tap there and I can see all the photos that we took in Akaroa, New Zealand, using Google Photos. Here's the photo that I really like. This was our lunch, but you can hardly see it. I could do some fixing in Google Photos editing, but I'm here to show you Snapseed. So I tap edit and then I scroll over until more. On the more menu, there's Snapseed. Now what I need is, you know, the, the water is pretty okay, but the lunch is so dark. So instead of applying an edit to the whole picture, I just want to brush on. So I tap tools and brush. And now I want to increase the exposure of the bottom part of this picture. I tap on exposure and it's set to 0.7. That's pretty good. Now I just rub. Ooh, look at that. Our lunch looks so much more appetizing now. <laughs> if I want it even brighter, I can tap on this up arrow. Higher is always lighter. 
and I can rub it some more. It's so much fun. It's kind of like finger painting. And if I like it, I tap the check mark. And then in the Android, because I started from Google Photos, it already knows what photo this is, what edits I've applied. All I have to do is tap done and I'm back to Google Photos and my original photo, but know that the saved edited photo is in this folder. You can go to folder, the Snapseed folder. So that's if you use Google Photos, but you don't have to. You can use Snapseed as a standalone app. And now I do want just to explain that further. We do have a pre-recorded video number 699. And then I'll go to the Chromebook. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Something didn't work. That never happens, right? <laughs> and hi, this is Chris Gould with Geeks on Tour. And I want to show you how I use the Snapseed app to improve my photos. I'm starting in Google Photos, and this is an Android. I'll do it on an iPhone in a minute. I, this is the picture I want to edit. I tap the edit button in Google Photos. Then swipe over on the horizontal menu until I see more. Snapseed, if it's installed on your phone, should appear there. Now I'm in Snapseed and I want to choose a tool. Tools. And the tool I always start with is Tune Image, the first one. Once you're in the tool, you swipe up and down on the photo to choose the specific option. In my case, I'm going to use ambiance. Once you've chosen ambiance, then you rub left or right to increase or decrease the amount of that option. Notice when I scroll, when I rub over to the right, the photo gets richer. You get more detail in the shadows and a darker blue sky. I like that a lot. And I tap the check mark to say I'm done with that. One other thing I want to do with this picture is take out that extra car back there. See, I want it to look like we were the only ones there. That's tools and healing. Now I get it so that I can I see that truck and I just rub my finger on it and it's gone. Check mark. And I am done editing this photo. I tap done and I am back to Google Photos. I can view my results here. Now I'm going to do the same thing using an iPhone. Snapseed works the same, but getting to it and back from Google Photos is slightly different. So here I am in Google Photos. Here is the picture, the original picture that I want to edit. You swipe up and tap open in Snapseed. Once here, I tap Tools, Tune Image, swipe on the photo until I choose Ambiance, then swipe right to increase the amount of ambiance. It's, it's a, I think, a fairly subtle difference, but just beautiful. You can look at the difference between your original and what you have now with this button in the top right. There's my original. There it is with the ambiance. I like it. I tap the check mark. I want to get rid of that truck. I tap tools and healing. Zoom in a little bit. Touch on the truck. And I don't like how that worked. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit more. There. Check mark. And 
there is no done. In the iPhone, you have to tap export and then save. And then you have to manually go back to Google Photos. It might take a minute before the photo from Snapseed shows up in your Google Photos, but then it will be next to your original on iPhone anyway. It'll be it it'll have a new date for today in Android. And that is how easy it is to make your pictures more beautiful using Snapseed. Give it a try. All right. I don't know, it's hard to express how fun it is to use Snapseed, especially when you're traveling and capturing just really cool photos. I see a cool photo, I snap a picture, and then I say, oh, I want to make that better. Hmm. <laughs> and, and Snapseed makes it so easy. Yep. All right, there's a couple more slides, and then I'll demo on the Chromebook. Okay. So a round trip from Google Photos to Snapseed and back. On the Android, you open the photo and tap on Edit, scroll over to More, and as long as the Snapseed app is installed on your Android device, you should see Snapseed there. You do your editing and you just tap Done. So easy. On iOS, you open the photo in Google Photos and you swipe up and you should see open in Snapseed there. When you're done, you tap export. And this is not available. There just is no such thing as Snapseed for Windows or Mac. However, there is for Chromebook. And why? Because your Chromebook can run Android apps. You need to open the Play Store on your Chromebook and install the Snapseed app. This doesn't work on all Chromebooks, but all newer Chromebooks, right? Yeah, I don't know. I think it would be hard to find a Chromebook these days that doesn't have Play Store, but it is something to check. And right, make sure. and if you've been on Chromebooks for a while, you may have an older Chromebook that does not use the Android Play Store. You just have to check. That's true. So the key is, your Chromebook must be able to run Play Store Android apps, Google Play Android apps. You also, to do it from Google Photos, need the Google Photos Android apps. So Chromebook using Snapseed from Google Photos, you must install the Google Photos Android app then and the Snapseed Android app. Then you can open Google Photos. You have access to your lifetime of photos. You can open them in Snapseed, do your edits, and save. And that's what I'm going to demo now. So this is my Chromebook. I'm just at the, what, what do you call that, the home page. And I open, well, here. You, you can click on the launcher and find all the apps that are installed on your Chromebook. And here is Google Photos. Oops, I was already in. Okay. So here is my Google Photos, my entire lifetime of photos. I can scroll through and you can see I can go back to September 1955 because I scanned old photos and changed the dates but I'm just going to stick with current ones. This is a picture of our camper van at a beautiful Florida State Park. But this picture isn't as beautiful as it should be. I can click on edit. So this is the Google Photos edit command. And I could do some edits right in Google Photos, but I'm going to go straight to Snapseed. How? Where you, um, this is checking if you're list, if you're listening. <laughs> How do I get to Snapseed from Google Photos on the Android app? I clicked on Edit. Now I find More all the way at the right side. More. 
If Snapseed is installed on your Chromebook, you can click on Snapseed. And notice that I'm using a mouse. You know, because this is a Chromebook, I have this full-size screen. So here, here you're seeing me with the actual screen. I can still use the touch screen capabilities, but I can also use the mouse if I want. So I'm going to click on Tools. I'm going to tap on Tools and then Tune Image. Now I can still rub up and down to get my options and choose Ambiance. I don't see any difference. What do I do to apply more Ambiance? I'm going to rub the screen. So if I rub to the right, I'm getting more. Do you see that difference? It's subtle, but beautiful. I get more color. I get more detail in the shadows. That's ambiance. If I want to see what my original looked like, long press. Well, or if you're still in process, I haven't saved this yet, then this little button in the upper right shows me my original, let go, and it shows me the edits. I like it. I tap the check mark. And how are we doing on time? Um, oh, okay. So I know what, and, and all I have to do, since this is the Android app, I don't have to know how to save it. It's going to do, it's going to, it's going to pick the one that it thinks is best when I just tap done. I tap done. I'm back to Google Photos and I don't see the edited photo there. I only see my original. Why is that? It has, the, the edited version has been saved to a folder on device called Snapseed. I would have to make sure that that folder has Google Photos backup and sync turn on. So here on device, if I click on on device, I will see the Snapseed folder and I need to turn on the backup and sync in order for that photo to be included in my Google Photos. But from now on, anything I do in Snapseed will be included and, and there it is. All right, now I'm gonna show you another cool tool in Snapseed called Healing. See the scratch on his face? There's nothing in Google Photos that I can do about that. Snapseed, I can. So I click Edit, and then More, and then Snapseed. And I'm getting this photo from my Google Photos library to Snapseed. I can click on Tools, the little pencil, and this one is called Healing. It has an, uh, an icon of two band-aids, and I always seem to lose it. There it is, Healing, Healing, the two band-aids. And now, notice that my mouse has a circle around it, so I think I want to zoom in a little bit, so I'm only getting the scratch. And I'll do that with my two fingers, my two fingers on the screen and spread them so that the scratch is just the size that I want. And now I can just touch the scratch. Is that cool? That's way cool. It makes me feel so powerful. <laughs> I can just touch and heal. The scratch is gone. And I like it. I click the check mark and I click done. And uh, it tells me that the new photo has been added to the Snapseed folder. And in a minute, it will be, it will be included in my Google Photos. There. Didn't take long at all. 
the original with the scratch is still there. The edited one without the scratch is right next to it. Let's just do one more. Here is the pumpkin patch. I think this is a cool picture, but there's this nasty piece of garbage in there. Edit and more and snap seed. And I'll, I'll try and tools, healing, and just click the piece of garbage and it's gone. Check mark, done. And we are back to Google Photos and we still have the original and we have the fixed version. All right. And I think, I mean, I have, I have so much more, but you can see it all on our website. We have a whole Snapseed course but let's just do one, one little recorded one. Uh, I do want to do, just because it's too much fun, the number 600. Number 600 shows a completely different feature of Snapseed that, as oh, I say, is just so much that's fun. That's what it was. It's not downloaded. Oh. It takes a minute to download. Oh. Schooled with Geeks on Tour. And this Show Me video is about how to improve faces using Snapseed's portrait tool and face pose tool. The last one, just because this is fun, everybody always asks, can you get rid of the wrinkles? <laughs> <laughs> and yes, there is a feature. You can also brighten up the eyes, move the chin up, and put a smile on their face. So this is a picture of my mom and use the tool called portrait and it automatically applied a face spotlight at 70 percent so her face is brighter than the rest and her skin has been smoothed a little bit but let me show you more in detail skin smoothing it says so i have face spotlight skin smoothing and eye clarity skin smoothing and i rub to the right and can you see, can you see how there are no wrinkles now? I rub to the left, the wrinkles are back. I rub to the right, and it's like it's been airbrushed. Let me show you the eye clarity. So watch your eyes as I rub to the right. I rub to, oops. Now that, it was showing you what the, there's the original picture. And there, now I, I did a little bit too much eye clarity, I think. <laughs> Original picture after improvement. I'll accept that. Then the last tool is, and just because it's too much fun, head pose. And watch it. So her chin, notice how her chin is kind of down. I think she should be looking more up. All I have to do is rub my finger up. <laughs> there you go <laughs> and she has actually a pretty nice actually kind of a mona lisa smile but but just watch what it does if i go down here to the adjustments and choose smile and rub to the right <laughs> <laughs> Okay, good. On that note. <laughs>
Eel. Eel. True or false, Snapseed will overwrite your original with permanent edits. False. It it creates a copy oh. or it adds a layer to your original. Okay. True or false, Snapseed also has a version for computers. False. False. Uh, you skipped four. Yes. <laughs> How did I do that? Four, where can you find the Geek Snapseed class materials, of course? The most important thing. Okay. Yeah. Where? Can I show that? Sure. Yeah, because what on our website, hopefully you all know our website is geeksontour.com. We are now keeping a listing of every time we do a presentation over Zoom and we have the course materials available. So if you just go to geeksontour.com and you can even just scroll down to where you see classes or it's the exact same thing up under the tutorials menu and all class presentations. It takes you to the same space, just geeksontour.com slash classes. And every time we do a class, we list it here. The, the, the uh oh, I didn't list January 26 yet. Okay, <laughs> I did. I did make it, but I forgot to put it on there. You have it on it. there. It'll be on there soon. Okay, so I'll just I'll do the January 24 just for you to get the idea. Once you click on there, you will see APCUG, and then a link to the class materials, and that includes the slide deck that we used. It includes the, a handout, a written handout, and it includes a playlist of videos, lots of which we didn't have time to show you today. So you can even learn more by going to this page online. And I will make sure it's listed. <laughs> okay. Okay, I'm done. You're done, we're done. I'm Chris. I'm no, Jim. <laughs> we're Geeks On Tour. And thanks. Yeah, you're not, you're, you're not done. Don't worry about that. You're not done. <laughs> okay. We'll, that we'll was fantastic. Questions. Oh, that was fantastic. Guess I can't look at any picture and not realize it's not an original. It can be better. Yeah. Okay. So we'll turn things over to Judy for starting questions. And then when she's done with her questions, we'll open up for open mic time. Okay. I just have to say, Sitting here in Santa Clarita, I had more fun. Thank goodness for the mute. I was laughing. I was clapping. I was nodding my head. I was going that way, that way, that way. That way. <laughs> I was working right along with you. I cannot wait to share this with my daughter, the, the photographer. And I love the chin business. Whenever <laughs> my son took a, a, took a picture and it would always come to me without any of this and i appreciated that so much i will ask her to do the same for me too okay but anyway uh do you have questions in your chat box okay where i think we covered every one that we saw the ones that came directly to us okay the only question i have was um are you uh using obs i am using obs and i i reply i replied yes but yes uh, but did it look okay? Everything came through. Oh yeah, there was a lag with voice and lips is all. But um, you, as you you know, you give fantastic presentations, and almost all of your questions get answered <laughs> as you're doing it. But over to uh, Kurt Trout from um, the Twin Cities Group. Do. Yeah, there's, there's, okay, he has, he has a hand up. Okay. Yeah. Hey, I, can we get a presentation on how you use OBS? <laughs> Marvelous. <laughs> Not from me. <laughs> well, they, you know, the OBS is such a cool program, but it is, you know, you can use just a little bit of it or you can use a lot of it. And uh, it's an open source program. It's free to use and it works on apples and it works on PCs. Uh, but there's a learning curve and there are a lot of good tutorial videos already up there. 
uh, and that's not what we do. <laughs> that's, we don't teach people how to use this technology. We use this technology, but we learn from other folks. We learn a lot about that from Michael Daniels. Michael Daniels, a, tinkering for tech. Tinkering with tech. Tinkering with tech. Yeah. Tinkering and and that's a that's a good thing. And who so. else is that? Nimmin or yeah, Nick Nimmin, Daniel, Daniel Patel. Patel. There are several pros out there who really do some nice video tutorials and how to use the the tools that we use. And Chris yeah, uses Camtasia for her screen recordings and her tutorial videos. We have over 700 and how many tutorial videos? <laughs> and we've done 220 some of our What Does This Button Do shows. We'll be doing another one this Sunday. Right? Yeah. Yeah. We might do <laughs> <Okay>. Snapseed. <laughs> that would, yeah. Yeah, that would be easy if we do Snapseed. <laughs> and we have some tools. And Jack, before we go, before we go over to Jack, I okay. want to thank Jack for hitting that reaction button so that he came to the top of our list. Remember, if you want to have a chance to talk, um, hit that reaction, put your hand up, go to the top of the list. And when we call on you, then unmute yourself and then mute yourself back up. So are we ready for Jack, Judy? Yes, because I raised my hand too. Yep. Jack. Jack, you're on. Thank you. Uh, one of my questions was already asked to, uh, answered. Uh, I asked it before the answer came uh, to Chris and Jim. Uh, my question is, uh, can the Snapseed be used for video editing as well? Or is that something totally different for video editing? Yeah, totally different. Yeah, it just works on photos. Yeah, there's there's no video editing in Snapseed. There's a little bit in Google Photos, but not much. But not much. And there's a little bit in Windows. Actually, it's Windows. There's, a, there's a Windows video editor that's not bad. I am going to start putting together some training on on, on the Windows, Windows video, video editor. So oh, very good. But we also use uh, Filmora. I use Filmora on my Mac. And, and I use Camtasia. And she uses Camtasia. So, so those are the video editors that we know and use. Over to Kevin. Thank you. Hi. I just helped somebody set up a Chromebook yesterday and then finished up this morning. And um, they did not have a touch screen on theirs. And I, when you were doing the Snapseed on the Chromebook, you were using the touch screen. I wanted to know how to do that. Uh, with using the mouse or the touchpad. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm not <laughs> sure. I mean, I've only had touchscreen Chromebooks. Mm -hmm. My expectation is that a non-touchscreen Chromebook would not be able to install Play Store, Play apps. Store apps. Does it? Do you no, know? No, it, it, when, when it's, a, it, it's it brand might. new, she just opened it up yesterday. So um, it does support the, it does, uh, it did have the Play Store availability. I wonder now that I'm, now that we're chatting, I'm wondering if the touchpad on the, uh, on the Chromebook would allow us to do that. Yeah, you probably That's can use Pinch and Zoom and, and, and that sort of thing with the touchpad on the Chromebook. That's good. Yes. Chris, Chris, if it, if it wouldn't be too difficult, would it be appropriate to have me ask you to do, try that since you've got it right there? Sure. She's yeah, trying it right yeah. now. Let's see. So. I got to uh, say, I love that you guys can do all the stuff you do with showing the view of, of Chris touching the screen. You guys are doing a fantastic job with this stuff. Well, that's, yeah, that's all Jim. He's, he's all the production. I'm the teaching. <laughs> Um, oh, so can I, can I point to something? So I'm, so do you see the mouse pointer? Uh, you need to share your screen, I think. Oh. Oh, yeah, here. <laughs> <laughs> Just when he was talking about how good he was. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Okay. You seeing it now? Yep. Uh, yes. So on the image where you see the camper van, right. you should see a mouse pointer moving back and forth. Yes. So that that is my finger on the touchpad. 
Right. Um, and if I then go to more and Snapseed, I'm doing all that with the touchpad or regular mouse. Now the question is though, can I use the touchpad to like zoom in, to, to put two fingers on the touchpad? Ah, yep, sure can. Yeah, but not just zoom in. When you do that little swipe up and down to choose yeah. ambiance and then to do the control of the ambiance feature. Well, then you hit tools. And the HDR feature. Uh, well, yeah, okay. So I have to be in a tool and I go to tune image and I'm doing all this with the mouse, the trackpad. Now, yeah, now I just drag down. I have to press and hold ah. and drag down or up. Ah. And I'm just, I'm just doing that with the... With the trackpad, yes. But you did have to press down on the touchpad. You do, yes. Gotcha. Yeah, just, just, just rubbing it didn't do it. I had to push down. Got and it. Rub. Makes sense. It, that sounds somewhat yeah. intuitive. Yeah. And same thing for the for the left and right. Oop, we lost you. Oh. You po you pulled out the plug. <laughs> yeah, she moved it around. We don't Thank normally you. let her touch things like that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, uh, Chris and Jim. That that that's terrific. I, I I had a feeling they could, but I really didn't know uh, exactly what would happen. Thank you. Oh, well, and, and the the other question would be whether or not uh, with a mouse, you know, holding down with the left, a drag across and back and forth across the screen. Yes. Would work. And so I'm I I have a mouse on this Chromebook, and I am holding down the left mouse button and dragging to the right and dragging to the right left. I can see it. And it, it works now, but I don't know how to, oh, maybe, maybe with the wheel. No, I don't, I don't see how to zoom in. I don't see how to do two finger. Control. I mean, there might be a way, but I don't see how to do two control, and control and scroll. And scroll. Yeah, it'd be, yeah, but you have to have two hands. No, control oh. with the mouse. Well, with the yeah, scroll yeah, wheel. But, you didn't, you didn't and... uh, Chris, you didn't zoom in and do the ambiance tool at the same time. You, you got into the ambiance tool, then you zoomed in, and then you adjusted with the tool. So right. I think you just need to do it in three, two steps or three steps. Well, okay. So I tool and tune image. And now with the mouse, I'm holding down on the left mouse button and I can scroll up and down, choose ambiance. I can hold down with the mouse left button and go left, right and left. If I control, it, it still does the same thing as just, and if I control, how about alt? Uh, no, maybe. I can't, I can't figure out how to zoom in and out. Okay, so, so, uh, with it in this state, uh, put your mouse on the picture, hold down control, and then scroll the wheel forward or back. It's me. Okay. Scrolling the wheel. I have the picture. I'm holding down on the control key. I'm moving the mouse. No, no. Wheel, the scroll wheel. The scroll wheel up, up and, and down, down, and it's not zooming in or out. Okay. Okay. Darn. All right. You need Thank to get you. yourself a Chromebook. <laughs> there there well, still might be a way, but no, I did, I was able to scroll in and out, to zoom in and out by putting two fingers on the pad, on the track yes. pad. And pinching yes. and yes, yes. Yeah, that, that, that was there. excellent. And, and do we- work with the mouse. Do we, and then the, the other set of questions, um, do, uh, do we ask, um, oh, for um, Chromebook for Mr. James' Bill, question. Bill James. Yeah. Yep, Bill ask James. Bill. He's sitting there, he's ready to go. Okay, now I got to go find my list of questions. I've got like four things open for your, your presentation, <laughs> his presentation, the questions for the presentation. Kevin? Uh, yes. Bill will be answering the questions. I'll send them out via email. He has, a, he has a page and a half. Ah, okay. In Word. Okay. Okay. All over, right. to, over to Bob G. For editing, try Screencast-O-Matic on videos. It's got quite a bit of editing in it, and it's a simple thing to use. That is a simple program, and would you please put that in the chat box for me? You can do that. The, the URL. No. I personally use uh, Windows Live Essentials 2012 video <laughs> editing program. I mean, if it Movie works, maker. why not? 
That's right. Uh, I have a question. The Snapseed handle H E I F or H E I C oh. files. Good question. I'm pretty sure the answer is yes, because all my iPhone, every picture I take is an H E I. So let me just let I'll let me check on that. This High is efficiency image. H E I C format. Yeah. Hmm. This is live Q and A. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there we go. No, I have to find an AGIF first. Chris, you've right. showed us that we don't need to buy a more expensive camera or right. take a college course in photography. We can do it all with uh, right. editing. Right. I used to, I love the HDR effect. And for many years with my $1,000 um, Canon digital H, uh, SLR camera, I would set it to auto bracket. So every time I took a picture, it took three, uh, a normal, an underexposed and an overexposed. And then Google Photos put them together for me in an HDR and I loved it. Now I only have to take one picture and the HDR feature of Snapseed does it almost as good. Not quite. Um, yes, I do see an HEIC that I edited in Snapseed. Yes. Thank you so much. And I'm just thinking of the 2022 digital photo contest. Are any of us going to be able to believe that they haven't <laughs> gone through this process and they will all come looking outstanding. Pity the judges. <laughs> Over to you, Dale. Okay. Um, yeah, I had put in a question in about um, OBS. What does that stand for? I'll let you. Oh, OBS what does stands, OBS stand for? OBS stands for Open Broadcasting Software. It's an open source studio for streaming and it uses a bunch of tools. It allows the multiple camera setups and the multiple backgrounds that I have, like the the sets that I use and the switching and and all of that stuff. So it, it is a program that allows switching of inputs and it creates a what's called a virtual camera so that I can send that out to Zoom or to StreamYard or any any streaming system. And it also allows you to record. It, it does a lot of stuff and it's free. And like he said, check out videos on YouTube on what it does. I understand that yeah, it has a high learning curve. And oh, we yeah. do have one um, APCUG group member who taught uh, Windows type classes at a junior college and they wanted him to use it. And he said, bye bye. <laughs> uh, I appreciate the fact that uh, the people who were asking about the HEI uh, actually define what that meant. A lot of us don't know all of these little acronyms. Okay. So at least Most of us don't. Up. We'd make yeah. stuff up though. And it's really. Uh, if there's a website or something where we can look these all up. You need, Dale, all you need to use, remember Google is your friend. What is H-E-I-F? John. Yeah, well. It, 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 go. And you, what is H-E-I-C? It helps when you're in the middle of listening to what's going on to, for understanding. That's all I have to that's you can do this. You can Google it while you're watching us. I do just, it all, all just the time. FYI. The main point, though, is HEIC and HEIF are the default photo formats that iPhones use. There and it's go. just a new compression algorithm. All of us have been using JPEGs or JPG files forever, and that has a compression algorithm. This newer one, it's by the same people that created JPEGs, is the newer, more high efficiency. And it's not by Apple, it's just that Apple is the first adopter of the high efficiency image format. Thank you. Sure. Over to Jack. Unmute. Oh, you muted back up. Thank you. 
Two short questions for uh, Bill. Uh, first, unlike other computers that can be updated with more RAM and hard drive and other components, I understand that the Chromebook cannot be updated or at least before. Is this still correct? That's correct. So you got to buy it just the way you want it right out of the box or you're stuck, that right? That would be correct. Yes, sir. Okay. Also, uh, I'm a Mac user with Mac apps as well. And you spoke mainly of Android issues or Android features. Does that mean that I am basically out of luck with respect to compatibility with my Mac apps and uh, Mac files? You would have to find a, com a compatible uh, one in the uh, Google Play Store or the Web Store. If they were, if they're cross-platform, then you would find the equivalent in one of those stores. So, say for instance, if you're using, uh, I don't know which Mac specific uh, software you're using, but there's always a possibility that there is an, a Windows or Android equivalent in one of those stores. Thank you very much. I have a question for Chris and Jim. Since Google will no longer store unlimited folders except to our Google Drive, what do you recommend? This was our show, our, our Sunday show a couple weeks ago. And we compared, the best comparative system is Amazon photos, but in the long run, it's going to end up costing you more. My advice is to stick with Google Photos. It is still the best. And, you know, so it costs me $20 a year now. It's where, worth it. Whereas it used to be 100% free. Right. Now it's $20 a year. I think it's well worth it. And Google gives you 15 gigabytes of storage for free. Amazon doesn't give you anything for free. It gives you five. You <laughs> get five with Amazon. Right. Unless and with you're Amazon, you need to have a Prime account, correct? Exactly. Exactly. And so that's I, 120 bucks. Yeah. Well, no, you don't need to. You don't need to. If you do not have an Amazon Prime account, then you only get five gigabytes of storage for free. At period. Amazon. $20 mm -hmm. versus $120, unless you happen to use unless you already have a prime account. Right, and Amazon right. does not store your videos. They don't, They stop you at five gigabytes for your videos for, yeah. unless you pay a lot more. And Google Photos does all of your photos and videos. And Google Photos just it has- It does a great job. Has features that nobody else has. You know, the map the Google Lens, you know, I, I would not be without them. <laughs> and you can, For learn, 20 bucks a and year? you can learn more <laughs> from Geeks on Tour. That is tour. You, you all sh and you all should subscribe. APCUG has a discount and I will put that in my follow-up email message. Uh, oh, she's you need just to get with going, us. maybe it doesn't. Uh, Hong Kong time up. She said, get get with them before you do anything sending out. Yeah, yeah, because our, our shopping cart changed and yeah, so. Okay, but, we'll do. But we'll fix you up, no problem. Not, not that I wasn't going back to 2019 for the Florida conference, right? <laughs> <laughs> we'll fix uh, you up. I, I, have uh, I have a question. Over to Kevin. Um, yeah, um, I'm trying to download the uh, Kevin. Play Store app. Ken, app on my, Ken yeah. time out. Raise hand, please. Over to Kevin Beauregard. Okay, I, I, had, I had raised my hand and then I lowered it. I, I was just going to mention that um, the person that was asking about the uh, HEIC, um, I had to face using an HEIC picture on Windows, and I don't know if, if that person was using Windows or not. So I, I didn't know if it was going to be germane. Um, I wound up having to get a, an app um, on the Windows apps on the Microsoft uh, Store to allow my Windows computer to um, be able to process. It was called CopyTrans, C-O-P-Y-T-R-A-N-S. Um, it's a tool rather than a native thing, but it does allow to convert HEIC pictures to JPEG so that you can use them on your uh, Windows computer. 
And I did put a link to a How to Geek article about both of those uh, formats. Good. Over to Ed. Please unmute. There we go. Hi. So, how could you would you use the heel button for something like somebody squiggled a line in to block something in the background in the photo? Or like what I've done in the past is my driver's license, I've erased the oh. number. Is there a way to get that back with, with the heel button? Or how would you do it? Back. Yeah, I like erase it, like erase it and have right. the yes. background back. Heel would heel would be a great way to to mess up a license plate number. And as long as you well, it would you you You're haven't not... originated, you haven't wiped out your original, so you still have your original. Okay. And you just yeah. use the one that was done in Snapseed for any sharing. Okay, yeah, because I've gotten pictures where somebody squiggled something and I want to know if I can I remove that or... Uh, well, not at the, th not unless you created the squiggle. Oh, okay. Oh. All right, well, that was a simple question. <laughs> Thank you. Gee, I have Bob and G and John, and they were both in unison going like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, heads went back and forth. Over to Ken. Okay, I have a question. Um, can you download SnapFeed using the App Store on an iPad, or do you have to download Play Store? No, App Store on an iPad. You know, there is an iOS SnapSeed, and there yep. is an Android SnapSeed. The okay. iOS one is on your iPhone's app store. Yes. All right. So I, I don't have to have the Play Store. No. Um, you, okay. you can't have a Play Store on an iPad. No. <laughs> you no. can only have. Yes. Oh, but okay. it, it works, it works on fine. Yeah. And okay. once you have it installed, I mean, other, it works exactly the same. I mean. Oh, okay. So I can do it through the app store. Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. Good question. Anybody else? Kevin. Kevin again. I knew it, man. You're still muted, Kevin. <laughs> Thank you so much, John. Uh, I'm not really a user of Google Photos, but I can see that people might want to have it both ways with the Snapseed folder. You may want to have it separate, the edited version of the photo to be separate on the Snap Snapseed uh, folder. But then there's times when you want to say, you know, I really don't want to treat this as a separate picture. I want this in with the rest of my Google Photos, possibly in the same folder as the trip I took where I was cleaning up that picture. Um, I noticed there was a dis there appeared to be a discrepancy between the different platforms. In one platform, it saved it into a Snapseed folder, and another platform, it saved it back into Google Photos. I think that was the Apple side. Uh, does the user have control of that? User has control on the Android side. In the iPhone side, you do not. Okay, so in the Android side, you could say, don't save the picture in the Snapseed folder, rather just save it in the Google Photos with the trip I took or something like that? Uh, yes, but it's exactly the opposite. <laughs> yeah, it will be saved in the Snapseed folder. And right. then you can choose which ones of those you want to be uploaded to your Google Photos if you want. Apple does not have a separate folder structure for, for pictures photos. and videos. Okay. It's all so, that's that's all you get. Right. So if I if I if I have folders in, in my Google Photos and I've modified one of the pictures in it using Snapseed, can I get that picture back into that Google Photos folder so that that picture is part of my folder that contains my trip. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, wouldn't it be very similar if you take a picture with your camera that doesn't automatically get uploaded to Google Photos, you could upload it to Google Photos. Manually. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Over to you, Shandon, and she's from Cajun Clickers in Louisiana. Good to hear from you again. Uh, unmute. Uh, I wanted to know if the app gets uh, 
updated automatically. I mean, I had it, I think, downloaded a long time ago and never used it. But after seeing this, I really want to use it. Good. Uh, well, it depends on the settings on your phone. You know, there's, do all of your apps get updated automatically? If so, then Snapseed will get updated automatically. But it's never a bad thing to just go to your, your store, either App Store or Play Store, and look at the Snapseed app and just see if there is an update available. Thank you. Over to Joanne. Who must be, who must know Kevin? Needs to unmute. Sorry. Hello. Um, Hello. I, I was wondering, um, I have had gallery as my photo a storage editor from the Samsung uh, tablets and phones mm -hmm. that I've had over the years. Um, is there a way to get everything off of gallery and onto photos, Google Photos? Yes. Gallery is the way to manage the photos that are on your device, on your Samsung phone. So if the, all those photos are on your Samsung phone, all you have to do is install the Google Photos app and turn on the backup and sync and it will copy all of the photos on your phone, which is the same as the photos in, in gallery. your gallery. Right. It will copy them up to Google Photos. Thank you. To your account in Google to Photos. To your account in Google Photos, yeah. Okay, thanks. And I'm sorry for interrupting, but Judy, I don't know this Joanne Beauregard, but my That's wife's true. name is Joanne, so I'm very curious as to who this Joanne Beauregard is. <laughs> oh my God. Oh my gosh. So, so is your wife curious. <laughs> okay, Joanne, Joanne. Kevin. What Kevin. computer club do you belong oh. to? Um, computers are easy user group in uh, Glen Allen, Illinois. Kevin? She's one, she's one of mine. Wow, that's so interesting. Um, I'm originally from Massachusetts. Yes. I'm, now living, I'm now living in Central Florida. I have my oldest brother lives in um, Naperville, Illinois for another few months before he and his wife moved to Colorado. And you belong to the fill in the blank computer club? I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, the Royal Highlands Technology Club in Leesburg, Florida. Yep, you're one of Dye's members. Right, exactly. Neat lady. All right, but it sounded like there might be some kind of a connection way back in Massachusetts. Uh, uh, Joanne, yes. I am so curious, but uh, how do we take this offline? I, I don't know how to do that. With I don't either, but I'll bet you related to me. Do you guys want me to send each other your email addresses? That yes. would be wonderful. Yes. Thank you so um, much. I mean, Thank not you. that you're not right together in my registration spreadsheet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Another you. service of APCUG yeah, benefits. <laughs> the benefit, please check that. I'm adding it to my member benefits list. Over to Ken. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to download this uh, Snap feed. But uh, on my iPad, but it only comes up with Snap Seed. That's what yeah. you want. Oh, it's not feed. No, Snap Seed, like snap, right behind. Okay. As okay. in tomato seed, except okay. I call it Sam, okay. uh, Snap Sneed, as in the golfer. You know. Okay. So. Thank you. That's Sam Sneed. I know it. <laughs> I met him a couple of times. Oh well, good. Yeah, nice guy. Okay, I, as I said, I have a laundry list of questions for uh, Bill. Homework. And I will be emailing to them and he will nail his feet to the floor and Frankie Cooper at his side and we'll get you the answers to all of your Chromebook questions shortly, so to speak. And does anybody have any questions for the Geeks on Tour? Nope. I want to thank both of you for outstanding presentations. I appreciate appreciate you guys taking the time. And like I told Chris, we just kind of go, well, 
with the flow. As how it goes, we just work our way along and the attendees really appreciate the presentations and you guys taking the time and putting all this stuff together. And I'm putting it over to John so he can do his thing. Yeah, sure want to thank everybody for joining us. And amazingly, this is the last Wednesday of January. Get that month out of here. We'll be back next month. We've got what, the first Wednesday and third and fourth. Uh, nothing on the second Wednesday because that will be the first of the new Saturday safaris that you'll hear about. And uh, we'll continue. As Judy would say, oh, if you have, oh, oh, oh. There's nothing on the first week of February. Okay. Ever, hardly, unless they request it like Bob Bowser did. Okay. Uh, would you tell thought, them about the Saturday Safari, please? Oh, I would be glad to. Uh, the Wednesday workshops have been going so well that we have had problems with VTCs. So we said, hey, this is great. Wednesday workshop, everybody likes it, everybody attends. Today we had 150 some almost. Uh, so we were going to drop virtual techs. But then Judy and I talked and said, you know, there are some people that are still working. They can't come to Wednesday workshops. So we said, okay, we'll give up a Wednesday or uh, skip a Wednesday and do a Saturday. And so it'll be the exact same format, only we're going to call it Saturday Safaris as we explore technology. Exploring and so, technology in depth. Yep. So that will be happening on February 12th. It'll be the same sequence that we did the VTCs, but uh, we'll change the format to what we do on Wednesday workshops uh, and apply that to Saturdays. And we're working on getting pre uh, presenters. And so then that means we'll be back uh, on a Wednesday, the uh, third Wednesday with Linux uh, Learning, Dave Melton sitting down there. He's got his head going, what are we doing? What are we doing? And then the fourth Wednesday. So uh, one of the benefits of, of uh, APCUG. Rosalie, question for the end. Unmute. All of that went so quickly. Is there someplace on the website or something that lists all of those activities? And are they free to club members? Uh, these are Go all ahead, Judy. benefit of your group's membership in APCUG. We have been doing them since uh, May of 2020 when we were all sheltering at home. And I thought you guys probably need something else to do to occupy your time when we weren't supposed to go out. And we started with one a month and now we're up to three a month. And uh, I use the first uh, week of the month to send the information out as to what's happening. And each workshop has a unique registration. And when you register, you get a pop-up that says, hi there, Judy's going to send out the uh, encrypted link on Tuesday night after a uh, prior to the Wednesday workshop after registration closes at 8.30 my time and your time, Pacific time. And so it went out at 9.19 last night and um, free for you. Yep. For your well, group's $50 membership a year. And and exciting news for Rosalie, because she signed up for today, she is now on the master list. And you will now get all of the uh, advanced notices. APC, Thank you. Uh, APCUG's AOI do not let us communicate directly with uh, group members. But, you know, you're attending one of our workshops. So your stuff is mine. Yeah. That's why we say we've got to match up your uh, email address with that. So yeah, so all of that stuff that we've got coming up. And what I was going to say before she went like this and said, no, we don't do it on the Mondays, is that anything, anytime you have an idea of what you would like to see, let us know. And there are some of you out there within the voice or uh, distance of my voice that can do what we do here and share something that you know and uh, be a, on a panel. So give us some ideas and volunteer. Kurt. Who's going to volunteer? <laughs> yeah, he, Kurt's going to volunteer. Uh, what time are the Saturday safaris going to be? 
Same time, 12 o'clock. Same time. They've always started at nine o'clock my time. Okay. You guys yeah. figure out your own time. And I want it to be done by. What's your time? <laughs> yeah, because I want it to be done because I need to have breakfast, okay? John needs the afternoon snack. Or I have to pick up the grandkids or That's something like right. that. Yeah. All right. So uh, if no other questions, thank you. I hope you've had a good January. And uh, we'll see you in February at the uh, Saturday Safari. And those of you interested in Linux and anything else, do you know what we do on the last uh, Wednesday in, in uh, March or February? No. Okay. We've been talking about different oh, topics. Like, no. <laughs> All right. Wrapping this up, those of you who were registered today will be getting a link to this video that was recorded, plus all the uh, follow-up that Judy's going to send you, all those questions and answers. Thanks, everybody. Judy, thank you. And Bill, thank you very much as my co-hosts. And, of course, to Chris and Jim for an excellent presentation. Uh, amazing.